Yeah, hi, thank you, welcome. Um, it is very exciting to be part of the BSA Medical Sociology Virtual Conference. Um, it's also slightly terrifying, um, particularly this is my first time recording a PowerPoint presentation and this is I think the 10th attempt this afternoon to get this into anything close to 20 minutes so bear with me I'll try not try to get through everything without talking too quickly. Um, so what I want to do within this uh, 20 minutes is explore some of the aspects of the pandemic for both disabled people and people with chronic illnesses and try to make the case for the use of ideas that work across both disability studies and medical sociology as ways that we can understand critically what is happening within the pandemic and to produce research which can challenge some of the things that are happening within the pandemic. Um, so I'll go through some of the key issues that disabled people and people with chronic illnesses have experienced during the pandemic and by doing so hopefully make a case that one of the things that is happening here is a dynamic of embodied conditionality that is affecting the citizenship rights of both disabled people and people with chronic illnesses. Now before I go on to do that just a very brief comment on the fact that I'm using the phrasing of disabled people and chronic illnesses. It is a bit clunky and I'm still thinking it through but why I'm using it for the moment is to retain the concept that disability is an external oppression on people with a variety of different impairments um, and some of those impairments can be uh, but may not be the product of chronic illnesses but I also want to retain the concept of chronic illnesses to reflect that aspect of living with a chronic illness which um, is experienced as being in a body which is different, a body that can be painful, limiting, and can generate dynamics of fatigue, and that the way in which that is experienced, both in an embodied way and as a sense of identity, may not match completely onto the concept of disability as an external dynamic of imposed oppression. So I'm working with both those concepts as we go through. So I want to, to start with highlighting some of what I think are pretty well known aspects of the way in which the pandemic has um, affected disabled people and those with chronic illnesses and to argue that part of that impact is one that is generated by the sense that the specific needs of disabled people and those with chronic illnesses are treated as an afterthought as things are imposed and then issues are highlighted and it's almost a dynamic of, oh, sorry, we didn't think about that. So some specific examples here. Um, so people who are on universal credit and working tax credits have been during the pandemic, been getting £20 more a week to reflect the additional costs that come with trying to survive a pandemic. It was highlighted that this was not extended to those who are on employment support allowance and personal independent payments i.e. disabled people and those with chronic illnesses and the government response was that it was too hard for the computer to figure that out so that um, additional payments have not been been given to people receiving those benefits. When the restrictions were introduced which said that you know to go out was to have one hour of exercise or to go shopping or to a medical appointment um, because then exercise became the only legitimate reason to be in spaces like parks. Uh, local authorities then removed park benches, covered over park benches, removed the right to sit and the restrictions very explicitly removed the right to sit. Um, the restrictions also limited opportunities to travel to different areas um, and as we've seen the number of times you could leave the house. And disability campaigners have highlighted that across those restrictions, various issues have been produced for people, uh, for disabled people and those with chronic illnesses because of the ways in which those restrictions were put in place and required you to move, and but only to move in particular areas at particular times. Another quite bizarre, to be honest, uh, approach of the UK government was to not have a, and to refuse to have a British Sign Language interpreter at the daily briefings. Um, 
They argued when this was challenged that the room was too small. But perhaps most importantly, the Coronavirus Act of 2020, which was passed with no opposition within Parliament, um, sailed straight on through, uh, gave councils the opportunity to halt their requirements under social care and that they could use the pandemic as a reason to say we're not going to provide XYZ for disabled people and those with chronic illnesses. Now these refusals of treatment, these restrictions which have not considered the needs of disabled people have been challenged by disability organisations, by disabled people themselves, by allies and crucially I think important to acknowledge the role of disability studies researchers within some of this work. It's led to a series of legal challenges which have changed things. Um, the rules on daily exercise have been changed to accommodate particular health conditions that justify people being out at different times of the day, out more than once in different locations, still not justifying or allowing people to sit, but some improvements within how the restrictions operated. Um, Disability groups have also challenged local authorities who have attempted to use the Coronavirus Act to reduce their provision of social care. Um, and we've also seen the campaign um, from deaf groups around the, the refusal to allow for a, a British sign interpreter within the press briefings. This became the hashtag, where is the interpreter? And on the screen is also one of the posters that they circulated as part of their social media campaign. This didn't move, uh, unfortunately, the UK government to change their position on this, but it has raised the issues of, of the experiences of deaf people into public debates. And we've seen that within face masks, which I will return to. So this is what we've seen so far, I've outlined so far, is the ways in which state dynamics kind of um, restrict disabled people and people with chronic illnesses in ways which are unnecessary. Um, or which particularly reduce their rights more than it does for others. But part of the way in which that also filters in and becomes part of social reality is the way in which that state enforcement is then socially enforced in everyday social interactions. And the ways in which people take on that social enforcement becomes another source in the reduction of rights um, for disabled people and those with chronic illnesses. And what I want to argue is, is ab they're ab that's able to happen because there is already an existing social dynamic which polices the rights of disabled people and those with chronic illnesses in public space. In particular, that, that dynamic is one that is focused on the fact that, or the social dynamic around the ways in which disabled people and those with chronic illness are seen as outside the normal as beyond normal society. And so therefore that dynamic of treating people who are different as therefore unwelcome feeds its way into then the dynamics of social enforcement of restriction policies in um, COVID societies. So one very clear concrete example of that is what's happening around the wearing of face masks. Now particular groups have been identified as being exempt from using face masks. But what's happening in the public sphere is that we're seeing lots of occasions where someone explains why they're not using a face mask and the response from others is well if you can't wear the mask you shouldn't be here so there's rejection of this person as belonging in public space so what this means is that disabled people have to navigate the restrictions in their social interactions with others and they're navigating the willingness of others to accept their right to be different and in public space. As I say, we can't understand that particular dynamic without placing it in a broader dynamic of where disabled people and those with chronic illnesses are framed as outside the normal. That what we're seeing are practices, discourses, interactional processes that place particular individuals, particular groups as outside normality. And what that speaks to is what Margaret Sheldrake refers to as a minimal hospitality that is offered by others to disabled people. What that then leads to, that Jackie Leach Scully talks about, is the hidden labour that disabled people undertake to manage others' discomfort with their presence. They have to do the work to make other people accept that they have a right to be in public space.
one of the ways we're seeing this now in COVID um, and the issue around face masks is disability groups are providing disabled people with badges that say, and here's an example on the screen, is one that says, I am exempt from wearing a face covering. And this badge is meant to be used by people to justify, legitimate their presence in the public sphere. But if then the response to wearing the badge is someone says, okay, you shouldn't be here. The dynamic of legitimation that's embedded in that badge and the wearing of the badge doesn't fully resolve the labour that disabled people have to undertake in order to be part of public space. So to move on to death rates now. Um, so one of the really important issues within the pandemic has been whether and how data was gathered on disabled people's death rates. Now, eventually the Office of National Statistics in June, three months into the pandemic, did produce some initial figures, which do seem to indicate that disabled people are dying in significantly higher numbers than other people. Um, and what that indicated is that um, men who were within the census in 2011 categorised as limited a lot, um, that their um, standardised rate of, de of death involving COVID-19 was 199.7 deaths per 100,000, while for women, the rate was 141.1 deaths per 100,000. And the equivalent rates for men and women who were categorised as not disabled in the 2011 census was 70.2 and 35.6. So a significant difference in the death rates between those groups. What we don't know, because it hasn't been understood yet, is why that difference. Of particular concern, it has also been um, the experiences of people uh, who are learning disabled and what their death rates are. There's been a lot of uh, social media dynamics and debates around this. So the Care Quality Commission has produced one figure, again in June, which indicated that deaths of learning disabled people had increased 134% in England during the pandemic. So something is happening here. It's unclear what, but something is clearly happening here. And it's worth noting that at the same time as this, that testing in residential settings were prioritising older residents and were not testing learning disabled people who are, again, present in residential settings. And we know learning disabled people were dying in residential settings. But again, this is not the first time. We have to connect the lack of good data and lack of understanding of the data within COVID-19 to an existing pattern of poor calculation and understanding and responses to death rates amongst disabled people before the pandemic. So we have the Learning Disability Mortality Review Programme, otherwise known as LEADER, um, and that has been reviewing the deaths of learning disabled people to explore whether they were properly examined and whether non-clinical issues such as failure to treat in time or gaps in social care played a part in the person's death. Um, the data has been produced across three reports, but the most recent report which just came out a couple of months ago says, quote, our updated data suggests that the disparity between the age of death for people with learning disabilities and the general population in 2019 was 22 years for men and 27 years for women. So there is a gap. And again, they indicate that their review of the data indicates that some of this gap is down to failure of care, failure of treatment of, of learning disabled people within healthcare and in social care. Again, we wouldn't have this data. We wouldn't know this if it wasn't for the work of disability organisations and people working within disability studies. Um, so Sarah Ryan and the Justice for Laughing Boy campaign are fundamental in the emergence of this data, their campaign, which began in the death of Connor Sparrowhawk, Sarah's son, um, in a healthcare trust, has highlighted not just what happened in his death, which was complete neglect, which ultimately was prosecuted, um, but also this pattern of not investigating deaths of learning disabled people within healthcare trusts, which led ultimately to the leader being set up. Um, so what all of this signifies is a lack of interest in exploring disabled people's specific vulnerabilities both to COVID-19 and to a broader lack of interest in both their lives and their deaths.
So just moving on to underlying health conditions and who gets treatment. Um, we're very aware, I think, of the term underlying health conditions, which came into very public prominence um, when deaths were being reported and are being reported in the UK and across the globe. Now, this term is not neutral. It's a problematic term in the same way the term shielders is a problematic term because what underlying health conditions is doing within these briefings on death is making a distinction between those who shouldn't die, the ones who should care about, the well ones, and those whose death is of less concern. One reporter from the Scottish Sun questioned Nicola Sturgeon asking why if the majority of deaths occurred in care homes, why were we being locked up at home? So there is a we and there's other people who can die. And this was challenged, I think, very powerfully and emotively um, around the issues around the death of Karina Kinnear. Uh, Karina Kinnear's so, uh, brother, who is the actor Rory Kinnear, wrote a series of articles, gave interviews, etc., talking about the death of Karina and how this wasn't a death of underlying health conditions. So in one article he wrote, so it was coronavirus that killed her. It wasn't her underlying condition. Prior to her diagnosis, she hadn't been in hospital for 18 months, an unusually carefree period for Karina. No, it was a virulent, aggressive, and still only partially understood virus that was responsible. A virus that is causing thousands of people, despite the unstinting bravery of the medical staff of this country, to say a distant goodbye to relatives who would still be alive had they not contracted it. No one could describe Karina as weak. She did not have it coming. She was no more disposable than anyone else. Her death was not inevitable, does not ease our burden, is not a blessing. She was vulnerable, yes. She needed the care of others to live. So this concern over who gets treatment and the role of underlying conditions within it came to a very concrete uh, reality with the introduction of guidance on who would get clinical care treatment, critical care treatment issued by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. In the early days of the pandemic, much of the concern was on who would get access to critical care and who would be placed on a ventilator if rationing needed to take place. To help with what is a very difficult decision that clinicians would have to make, NICE introduced this guidance and within the guidance they made use of what is known as the clinical frailty scale as part of the decision making algorithm within the guidance and this is a diagram which um, displays the cl clinical frailty scale and what it does is it classifies different levels of frailty based on your dependence on others. Um, so if you are mildly frail um, you are someone who is evidently slowing, but you need greater help in aspects of daily living, such as finances, transportation, etc. If you're moderately frail, you will need help with all outside activities and with keeping house. If you are severely frail, you will be completely dependent for personal care on others. So the understandable concern for disability groups is this could e very easily define the lives of many disabled people who need others to support their personal care and daily living. And if this scale is used, then what would that mean for their access to critical care and to ventilators? So this again led to a series of challenges, which as a result, NICE did adapt the guidance by stating that the frailty scale should not be used in younger people, people with stable long-term disabilities, learning disabilities or autism. But this understandably has not appeased the concern that there remains worries that uh, disability or chronic illness are themselves a factor in clinical decision making and what does this mean for those who fit within that category of underlying health conditions. So I want to tie this together through a concept of entitlement and embodied conditionality. Um, and what I want to suggest is what's happening to disabled people and those with chronic illnesses within the pandemic is that their entitlements to be in society are being reduced and they're reduced through embodied practices of conditionality that we're seeing in the types of things that I've just highlighted.
Now, I'm using conditionality as a term which emerges or has emerged in social policy as a way to explain the ways in which welfare rights are increasingly conditional on proving one's eligibility. And I and others have talked about the ways in which disability benefits operate clearly within this dynamic of conditionality and how people have to prove their eligibility for those benefits. And that what's happening in COVID-19 are the multiple ways in which we need to think about the relationship between citizenship and bodies. It's so clearly completely entangled within each other in what is happening here. And that we can only understand what's happening to disabled people and those with chronic illnesses within COVID-19 by recognising that they were already in the margins of society before COVID-19 occurred. And that marginal position that is, condition, that is conditional is something that enables that greater marginalisation within COVID-19. So I think it's a factor in the ways in which disabled people and those with chronic illnesses are made vulnerable to COVID-19. There are vulnerabilities that come with the virus, but there are vulnerabilities that come through embodied conditionality and how that is occurring. And just two quick examples because of time. Um, one is the completely avoidable death rates of people in social care, particularly those in residential settings, but also those within privatised and outsourced provision of personalised care. We've seen so clearly that social care has been stripped of its capacity, not just to respond to a pandemic, but to adequately support people in other circumstances. And this can only happen if those who are reliant on social care are seen as disposable are seen as not quite citizens. So as Francis Ryan says, the idea that poverty, isolation, or even early death is somehow natural for disabled people is still worryingly prevalent. It's just this dynamic we see around social care, around COVID-19, that these are acceptable levels of death that we are seeing amongst people in our society. The second dynamic of embodied conditionality, I just want to briefly highlight, is the dominance of neoliberalism and values of individualism. Now, critical disability studies writers have argued that what we're seeing in the global north is granted a move away from mass, mass incarceration of disabled people towards rights being compromised instead by the requirement that individual disabled people prove their worth and prove their worth by their capacity to mimic normality. So Mitchell and Snyder talk about that in terms of this is a biopolitics that involves a move towards a productive massaging of ways to live one's life appropriately within the community without disrupting the naturalised normative activities of citizenship, which has clear echoes to arguments within medical sociology, you know, concepts such as Nicholas Rose's arguments around the ways in which contemporary medicine emphasises the individual responsibility to look after the body. Within COVID-19, it is our individual responsibility to manage our risk. So if you relate this back to COVID-19, I think what we're seeing is three areas of particular concern around this individualism dynamic. First, that we're seeing in some of the arguments around um, disabled people and those with chronic illnesses have a right to public space. We see the sort of drift into an argument that says, well, because they're productive, because they're useful, we should either mourn this person's death or accept this person into public space because they do useful stuff. And doing that, we retain an ableist hierarchy which says that your level of access to public space or your level of recognition for your death is dependent on how useful you were in life or could be in life. Another dynamic of this, this individualism is the retention of a myth that there are normal and safe bodies and there are not. Um, because in a sense, in COVID-19, one could argue that the risky body is the normal body. It is the asymptomatic body, assured in its protective layer of wellness, which moves through society spreading the, spreading the virus, justified by an individualistic dynamic. And then finally, obviously, the main major problem with individualism here is the abdication of state responsibility for where we now are. So to conclude, um, COVID-19 has laid, bar, laid bare 
the socioeconomic fragility of particular embodiments. We connect this, we can connect this to a time of individualism and austerity that has rejected care, interdependency and vulnerability as values worth recognising and supporting within the state and in society. As many have identified, we need to reinvent social and health care to move past the clapping of hands to the valuing of those who work and use social care as an important marker of a society that recognises that disabled people and those with chronic illnesses are entitled. And I want to leave the last words to Magna Zerota from the Sisters of Frida, an uh, organisation for disabled women, um, and her plea that we don't return to the life of before. I am alarmed every time I hear that we should go back to normal ASAP, because this innocently sounding normality from the perspective of disabled women is underpinned by systemic and daily violations of human rights. I do not resuscitate this version of the world.